So whatever happened to the doomsday bomb from beneath the planet of the apes? Let's find out. Movies. Music and monsters. Hey guys, Dan Monroe here, talking about movies, music, and monsters. Beneath the Planet of the Apes, definitely another one of my guilty pleasures, was the second installment in the ever-popular original Apes franchise. I gotta admit, right off the bat, that this particular film has a really soft place in my heart. Not because it was the greatest movie or even the greatest sequel, but I'm pretty sure it was the very first Apes movie I ever saw. And to me, that makes it super special. I mean, to me, as a kid, this movie had everything. It had the enormous ape army. It had the super cool general with that awesome hat. The only good human is a dead human. And yes, the hat still exists. Video on that coming soon. It had not only a bunch of old familiar faces, but it had a couple of new faces and a bunch of creepy mutants that had no faces. I mean, come on, as a 10-year-old, what's not to love about that? When I was a kid, my brother and I had the Ken's film, 8mm black and white silent film of this movie, and that 9-minute reel was basically the entire final scene of the movie. I can't tell you the number of hours we spent sitting in a darkened room watching the guerrilla army attack the doomsday bomb in glorious, silent, black and white. And yes, the bomb. The doomsday bomb. My God, what a lovely souvenir from the 20th century. Oh, the sweet bang of peace. I reveal my inmost self unto my God. And you know, other than Taylor's spaceship, this bomb was probably one of the largest and most recognizable props from the original series. It was so popular, in fact, that they actually used it in two of the Apes movies. But we'll get to that. Pretty quickly after the enormous success of Planet of the Apes, the inevitable sequel began being considered by 20th Century Fox. But don't be mistaken, there were originally no plans whatsoever to do a sequel to Planet of the Apes. The producers went to Rod Serling at first, same as they did with the Planet of the Apes movie. They even tried to get the original author, Pierre Boulle, who wrote a first draft of a script where Taylor leads an uprising of the enslaved humans to take back control of the planet from the general ape Ursus. Yeah, I can kind of see that working. This draft was called Planet of the Men and was pretty quickly rejected by Fox because it didn't have the visual shock and surprise ending that the original had. So they dropped it. I don't know, man. Might have been cool. Eventually, British writer Paul Dane was hired to develop a script tentatively called Planet of the Apes Revisited. Actually, it was Paul Dane himself who added the doomsday bomb to the script. Mostly because of his own personal fear and trauma regarding atomic bombings and nuclear warfare. Production on the film began in February of 1969, now titled Beneath the Planet of the Apes. Unfortunately, it had its budget literally cut in half from $5 million on planet to now only $2.5 million for Beneath. That is quite the cut. And speaking of budgets, I know money can be tight these days, but there's one thing I know you can't be without, and that, my friends, is reliable online safety. So I'd like to take one minute to talk about today's sponsor, Aura, which is really quite an amazing company for making sure that you're protected online. I mean, think about it. The odds of you getting captured by talking apes is about 1 in 100 billion. But the odds of your information getting hacked? 1 in 4. 
it's bizarre, but there are people online called data brokers who literally sell your personal information. Addresses, bank accounts, whatever, it's all out there. So, after Aura reached out to me, I did a little investigating about my online information. They showed me who was selling my information and automatically submitted opt-out requests, which is pretty cool. I also get top-notch antivirus, a VPN, identity theft protection, all in one place at more than a reasonable price for all that. So, if you want to give it a go, go to Aura.com slash Dan Monroe to start a free two-week trial. Link in the description. Aura, give it a try. I did, and it works. And now, back to the apes. Fox had recently had a whole string of, let's just say, films that underperformed significantly. Okay, let's be honest. They bombed. Get it? Bombed. Star, Hello Dolly, Tora, 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 just to name a few. So basically budgets were just slashed all across the board. And this is one of the main reasons why we see 80, 85% of all the apes in Beneath wearing those cheaper, slightly goofy looking pullover masks. Just not enough time or money in the budget to do that kind of intricate makeup on all those actors. The lead characters got the makeup, the background guys got the pullovers. The budget was so tight that they literally just reused a lot of large set pieces from movies they had previously just finished filming. The Mutant Council Chamber was a redress of the Grand Central 42nd Street Station, and the Temple of the Bomb was a huge set from Hello, Dolly. Kind of interesting that in this movie, the bomb is only referred to as the Doomsday Bomb. However, in the very cool Beneath the Planet of the Apes book and record set by Power Records, come on, who didn't have that? They referred to the missile as the Alpha Omega Bomb. Really kind of cool that both the book novelization of the film and the power book and record set both used an earlier version of the ending rather than the ending that we actually got in the film. In these versions, Brent didn't kill Ursus, and as Taylor is trying to reason with Dr. Zaius, Ursus repeatedly shoots him right before Taylor sets off the bomb. I don't know, I kinda like the ending we got in the movie myself. That was the end of the bomb in Beneath, but that wasn't the end of the bomb in the movies. In Battle for the Planet of the Apes, there was one scene filmed with the Doomsday Bomb, but that scene never actually made it into the theatrical release of the film. I'm not really entirely sure why, but it's possible that the producers wanted to leave the series on a positive ending rather than inferring the possibility that history may repeat itself with the destruction of Earth. That's just a theory of mine, but it seems to fit the facts. However, in subsequent DVD and Blu-ray releases, that scene has been restored. If you've never seen it, check it out. It's definitely worth the watch. One thing I really loved as a kid was that stock 20th Century Fox sound effect for the submachine gun. You know it. Love it. You know, like Logan's run, for the life of me, I cannot figure out how this film ended up with a G rating. You got upside down apes, bloody, being crucified as they're burned. You got Brent, literally torn to shreds at the end of the film from the apes' submachine guns. This was G rated and made for kids? Wow. You know, this is really interesting. In early drafts of the script for Beneath, the bomb didn't actually destroy the entire planet. It just destroyed the city and all the mutants and the ape army along with it. In these earlier drafts, Taylor, Brent, and Nova all lived. But as the story and script developed and the pressure mounted to get Charlton Heston back, he made it very clear that he would reluctantly agree to do this film on two conditions. 
One, his salary is donated to charity, and two, that he is personally allowed to destroy the entire planet to make sure that there would be no more apes movies. Of course, at the time, they agreed with him to get him into the film. Yeah, Chuck, whatever you want, you got it. Never underestimate the power of greed when it comes to Hollywood franchise producers. Beneath the Planet of the Apes opened May 26th, 1970 and was a surprise runaway success, grossing over $250,000 alone in its opening week. And according to Fox, the film needed $8 million to break even and in six months made nearly $14 million. Not too shabby for 1970. Okay, come on, Dan, let's go. What happened to the bomb? Well, like most props and movie sets back in the day, they were either destroyed or set on the back lot in case they were needed again for another film. And that, luckily, is exactly what happened. And here it is, the Doomsday Bomb. These amazing photos of the Alpha Omega bomb were taken approximately 1973 or 1974 on the back lot of 20th Century Fox. To my knowledge, these are the only photos of the bomb that exist since the movie. <laughs> From what I understand, the gentleman who took these photos back in the day claimed that there was actually a large family of rats living inside the bomb. You can see that the fins that displayed the alpha and omega lettering are gone at this point, and there's obviously plenty of wear and tear from the elements, but the overall structure is not only intact, but still incredibly glorious looking. That being said, we would have to logically assume that at some point between 1974 and the late 70s, the bomb was removed from the lot and thrown out. It was such a large prop that if it did still exist today, I'm pretty sure it would have turned up somewhere. Now buckle up. As sad as it is to learn the eventual fate of our beloved Doomsday Bomb, if you look close, there is a very interesting and iconic apes prop that was sitting right next to the Doomsday Bomb on the Fox back lot. Recognize that? You should! And the story behind this iconic spaceship is not only interesting and completely, utterly fascinating, but that, my friends, is the topic of another video. I really hope you enjoyed that retrospective on the bomb from beneath the planet of the apes. And if you're new to this channel and you like this kind of stuff, please consider subscribing. I have got a ton of new videos on the way that I know you guys are just going to dig. And please feel free to stop back anytime as we continue our conversation on movies, music, and monsters. Movies, music, and monsters. 